Honda. All right. Three, two, on and on. It should be on screen. Yes. We're good. Okay. Titus 2. God that bring us salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority that no man despise them. So our topic this hour is going to be the motivation of the grace of God. We've seen the appearing of the grace of God, and we've seen the teaching of the grace of God. Now we're going to see the motivating of the grace of God. So how do we motivate the grace of God? How does the, mode, the, the grace of God motivate us? In verse 12, we see that the grace of God teaches us that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly. Now again, how do you do that? What motivates us to live like the saint of the most high we are if we're in? That we are if we are saved. What what motivates us to do the should, right? Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly. But what motivates us to do the should? Look over at Romans 6. Very similar to the question that Paul asked here in Romans 6, verse 1. What shall we, 6 1, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer there? Why shouldn't we continue to live in sin if we're forgiven? Does it really matter? In fact, if sin causes grace to abound, why shouldn't we just keep sinning? If the more sin there is, the more grace there is. If we sin more, won't there be more grace? Look at Romans 3, and then Paul's accused of this. Look at Romans 3 and verse 8. Verse 7. For if the truth of God hath more abounded through my life unto his glory, why yet am I also judged a sinner, and not rather, as we be sent, slanderously reported as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come, whose damnation it is just. I mean, this is a common attack on those of us sitting in this room today, right? Well, you guys go out and you, treat, you teach grace and you teach we're not under the law and you're just teaching people to go out and sin. People are already doing that. Yeah. We're telling them what we're trying to provide is to provide an answer to the victory over sin in our day-to-day lives. The same attack that's made on us today is the same attack that was made on Paul 2,000 years ago. There's nothing new under the sun. Things don't change. Look over at Romans 5. Verse 20. <clears throat> Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so my great grace, I'm sorry, even so my grace reigned through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. No matter how much sin there is, there's more than enough grace to cover. God has enough grace to cover all sin. All the sins of the world and all the sins of you individually as well. So what I want to look at is the motivation. What is the motivation? This is not unlike what the conversation we're having this afternoon. Is the motivation to get a reward? Is the motivation to get a higher place in the position of authority out in the government of the heavens? And a lot of people think that that's the motivation. Here on earth, I want to live the most godly life I can so that when I get to heaven, I have the best, greatest, most gooder position I can have. Did you say good? I did say good. <laughs> <laughs> Second, I, word I'm adding in my vocabulary. <laughs> Second Corinthians 5. Second Corinthians 5, verse 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. 
this is the motivation. This, this verse is the motivation for the Christian life. And you guys know I really don't like that, that term Christian life. This is the motivation for your life. If you're a Christian, that should be your life. Not our love of him, but Christ's love of us. Christ loved us, and he died for us, and we should live unto him which died for us. Not only did he die for us, but look at the end of verse 15, the last two words, three words, and rose again. Our Savior lives. We are the only people, Christians are the only people that worship a living Savior. Every other hero of every other religion, if I can put it that way, is dead and still in the ground. Our Savior lives lives and that's where the power is we've seen earlier the power is in the resurrection our savior lives he loved us when we were sinners he died for us and he rose again for our very justification um look back at romans 5 we're going to be that, that, that we're going to be in and out of second corinthians there so you might might mark might mark that okay <laughs> can't be saying too many words that start with the same letter getting to be a long day. Romans 5, verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. But not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us in that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Lord Jesus Christ died for us when we were sinners. God loved us enough that he sent his son to die for the very ones that had offended his justice. If they would simply believe as he did in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We can glory in tribulations. Because the tribulations teach us how to live godly. They give us an opportunity to live godly. Tribulation is the canvas upon which the life of Christ is lived out in you. It's easy to live good when things are good. You can get over the top. But, it, but I tell you what, it's tough. When tribulation comes, when the world's falling apart around you, it's tough to put the, the peace of God on display. It's tough to put the life of Christ on display. Because one thing you want to do, you want to go fix a problem. You want to get there and get involved. And I, I'm the ultimate fixer. My nickname actually <laughs> is the fixer. And you know what? That's a problem. I, I, you, can get your, you can get in your own way a lot. That's how tribulation works for us. The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. We have the opportunity through tribulation to put the love of God, the love of Christ on display. Again, that's not our love of him, but his love of us. We put his love on display by loving others, by being patient, offering our experience to others as they go through their own tribulation, proclaiming hope when all may seem lost. And that hope is what overcomes shame because the love of God is shed abroad in your hearts. You don't need to be racked with shame, with guilt because you're a sinner. God knew that. I said earlier, God knew that when he sent his son to pay the penalty for your sins. He died for you in full understanding of the fact fact that you were and are going to sin he died for you when you were a sinner he didn't die for you once you decided to trust him he died for you can i put it this way he died for you in the hope that you would put your faith in him should you be repentant about sin absolutely you should we said earlier you should stop sinning but there's a way that you do it to have victory you, can, uh, you, know, you guys have all heard me say many times, you can stop anything for a short period of time. But if you do it in your own flesh, you will eventually fall back to the from, to the deny. You won't be in the to, you won't be in the live, unless you rely on the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at 2 Corinthians 7.
verse 10. There is a bit of shame, a bit of guilt that leads to repentance, right? Godly sorrow leads to repentance, but worldly sorrow worketh death. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. The sorrow of the world, that, that self-wracking guilt that we saw in Romans 7, O oh, wretched man that I am. Boy, you, you see how the sorrow of the world, the, that, that self-condemning guilt, the stresses result in all kinds of physical maladies, you know, due to stress. But you're forgiven. Should you sin? No. But you should focus on who you are in Christ. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Allow the Holy Spirit to transform your mind, to strengthen your inner man, to build you up in Christ, to develop that mind of Christ in you, and then let that live out in you. Let that live out. Put the life of Christ on display. That tribulation, again, is that canvas. Your life is that canvas through which you put the life of Christ on display. Um, look back at 2 Corinthians 5. Our motivation, the grace motivation, what motivates the grace life today? For the love of Christ constraineth us. That word constrain means to compel or force, to urge with irresistible power or with a power sufficient to produce the effect. And that really is the center. We think of constraining as stopping you from doing something, right? But that's not the way they use it. I actually brought an old book just to prove my point. This is a hundred-year-old book. And he uses the word constraint, talking about Jacob. And where did he put it? <laughs> this will be awkward. Huh. Anyhow, he uses the word constrain. <laughs> Even more. Oh, right there it is. Okay, talking about Jacob. Because of differences with his father in law, Jacob was constrained to free from Haran with his wives and possessions. He was moved with an irrefutable ear, with a power sufficient to produce the effect. Let's put it that way. With irresistible power, he was urged to move away and go back to where his family was. We, like I said, we think today in constraint and stopping. No, it's to compel or to force. And the sense here is really to urge with a power sufficient to produce the effect. The love of Christ is that power that's sufficient to produce the effect. The love of Christ is what motivates us. It's not just that we're so grateful for the love of Christ that we live unto him which died for us, though that is, in fact, part of it. We do need to be grateful. But that very same love of Christ, his grace, is the power that's sufficient to produce the effect, the change, the transforming of our life. What is the effect that is trying to be produced? is that we would live unto him who died for us, not unto ourselves. From living for ourselves to living unto God or to living for others. You see that change, from and to. That's why we've been talking about this, from and this to. We can live unto him which died for us because the life of, love of Christ is powerful enough to transform us by the renewing of our mind. That transforming of our mind takes us from shall we continue in sin to approving what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You see how the mindset's changed? Okay, I have the grace of God. Jesus loved me. He died for me. Shall we continue in sin? No. Instead of asking that question, you're over here going, okay, I'm dead to sin. Let me approve what's that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Let me put it on display. Because the love of Christ is that power that changes me inside. And I can live out the life that I should. I can live out the life of Christ. Because the life that I now live is the life of Christ. Is lived by the faith of Christ. Can I tell you also, it is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God that you not sin. As we talk about this, we're not talking about an excuse for sin. We're talking about stopping sin. That you do it through the power of Christ. The love of Christ, like the grace of God, can do more than one thing. The love of Christ was part of our justification. You see that in verse 14. For the love of Christ constrained us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. He died for us. 
It's also part of our sanctification. The other thing is, in our definition of constraint, it's to urge with that power sufficient to produce the effect. The power is the love of Christ, his love of us. Not anything inside of us that produces this effect. No matter what you think about yourself or somebody else that you hold in high regard, we are not strong enough to produce the effect. We are not strong enough in our flesh to live a godly life. We do it by relying on God. So this issue of love, I want to I take some time and I want to look at it because the, we started this thing, the motivation of the grace of God, it's love. That is the, that how grace motivates it. It motivates through love. Look over at 1 John. 1 John chapter 4. Put a marker here because we'll be in and out of this. 1 John chapter 4. First John chapter four and verse nineteen. First John four verse nineteen. We love him because he first loved us. Even our very love of him is powered by his love of us. He loved us, therefore we can love him. We wouldn't love him if he didn't love us. And that hits right at our egos. I, I understand that. But we love him because he first loved us. Look back up at, at verse 8. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. We're going to talk about that, that God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. There's that motivation. God loved us. We ought to love one another. He loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. God loved us and he gave us his son. And that's what we're going to see. We're going to see God loves and God gives. And we're going to see that how give, love and give go hand in hand. Keep, us, keep a, a hand here in 1 John, because we are going to come back in just a sec, but let's go back to Isaiah. Isaiah 43. Isaiah 43 and verse 4. What I want you to see is the relationship when God says he loves God also gives, and God is love. Isaiah 43, verse 4. Sp speaking to Israel, Since thou wast precious in my sight, thou hast been honorable, and I have loved thee. Therefore will I give men for thee, and people for thy life. He loves, and he gives. Look over at the book of John, the gospel of John, if you will. John 3. Hopefully a verse we all know. If we don't know, you should memorize it, Jocelyn and Natalie. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God so loved that he gave. Look at verse 35. The Father loveth the Son and hath given all things into his hand. The Father loves and the Father gives. You see this issue of love and give. Look over to Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, verse 2. Verse 1. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Christ loved us and he gave himself for us. Look at 2 Thessalonians 2.13. 2 
2. Second Thessalonians 2, verse 16. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. Comfort your hearts, establish you in every good word and work. You see there, he loved us and he gave. You see the issue? You can't miss it. Between love and gave. Love and gave. I was in a meeting one time, sitting around talking to some people, and the lady made a comment. This was the beginning of the end of my association, but the lady made a comment. She said, I have learned through a series of events in my life that I can love without expecting anything in return. And she's very heartfelt, and, and it was, you know, she'd come to a, a very good place in her life because of that. But that's not love. Love is not expecting a return. Love is to give, and that's the motivation. That's the motivation. That's how grace motivates us, to love is to give. If you're expecting something in return, it's not love. It's not grace. It's expectation. It's work. It's the law. You really see this a lot in family dynamics. I love that person, so I did this for them. I really hope they do something back for me. And these are the people that you're close, should be the closest in your... And you know, again, we, we all do it. I'm, you know, one finger, finger's going that way, three are going back at me. But it's, it's interesting as I look back. Boy, you see that a lot in family dynamics. I love my fill-in-the-blank, and I did this for them. And they never did anything for me. No, if you love, then you give. Go back to 1 John. 1 John 4, 18. 1 John 4, 18. Don't forget we read in verse 8, God is love. 1 John 4, 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear. Because fear hath torment, he that feareth is not made perfect in love. There is no fear in love. There is no fear in God. God lives to give, not to take. God lives to share himself through the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. The Godhead lives. It's the only word I know. What to, the Godhead has existed forever. But the Godhead lives to give glory to each other, to express their unity and their love for one another. And they love to give that to their creation. The members of the Godhead are not fearful that the other members of the Godhead are going to get more glory than they will. They're not fearful that by giving glory to one member of the Godhead, they're somehow diminished. Each member of the Godhead loves the others and wants the others glorified. Come with me back over to the Gospel of John. John 17. John 17, verse 1. Well, before we do that, I want, let me just show you something here while we're talking about this. John chapter 17. Come with me real quick to verse 2. As thou hast given, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. Verse 4. I have finished the work which thou hast, gavest me to do. Verse 6 which thou gavest me, the end of verse 6, and thou gavest them to me. Verse 7, that all things whatsoever thou hast given. Verse 8, for I have given them the words which thou gavest. It goes on and on and on, over and over in this passage. In John chapter 17, you see the word gave or given. You see it exactly 17 times. John 17 has the word give, gave or given 17 times in it. If there's a book about love, it was 1 Corinthians 13, but if there's a book about love, it, undoubtedly it's the book of John. You can't help but miss God's love if you read this gospel. John 17, verse 1. This issue of the members of the Godhead glorifying each other, giving each other glory, if you will. 
17 verse 1. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son that thy son may also glorify thee. Verse 5, verse 4. I, this is Jesus Christ, I have glorified thee on earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. The Father and the Son live for the glory of the other. The Father and the Son do everything for the glory of each other. They give glory to each other. Look back at John 16, 13. John 16, 13. Speaking of the Holy Spirit, how be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. The members of the Godhead living for each other. Now, there's no way we would say that. If we were the Holy Spirit, and if I can say this humanly, if we were the Holy Spirit, we would certainly talk about us. Look what I'm about to do. Look what I can do. No, the Holy Spirit doesn't speak of himself. The Holy Spirit speaks of Christ. He's glorifying Christ. The members of the Godhead, they all, God is love. God gives. They all give glory to each other. They're not fearful. They're not fearful. The Father's not fearful that glorifying the Son diminishes the Father. He probably doesn't even think it that way. The Holy Spirit's not fearful that giving glory to the Son is diminishing Him. The Son is not fearful that glorifying the Father is diminishing Him. They're all living for each other because they all love. The love of Christ is the motivation. We can look at the way that Godhead lives for one another and see the example of how love motivates of God's grace motivating us. As the Godhead does everything for the other members of the Godhead, so should we do things with others in mind as well. Look over at um, Philippians 2. Philippians 2, verse 1. If there be, therefore, any consolation in Christ... If any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye, me, my, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Let not every, look not every man in his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Verse 3 and 4, that's love. In lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man in his own things, but every man also on the things of others. You can only do that if love's motivating you. If you're doing that, hoping that something's coming back to you, you're not doing that. You can only do that verse if you're operating on the premise of love. And God is love, and love is to give. In verses 5 through 8, we read this passage earlier. Lord Jesus Christ obeyed the Father. He lived his life unto God. He was obedient unto God. In 9 through 11, you see that he obeyed all the way to the death on the cross. And what did the Father do? Glorified the Son so that the Son could glorify the Father. Look at it in verse 11. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's glorification of the Jesus Christ. To the glory of God the Father. Jesus Christ gets glorified and that glory goes to the Father. The Father's glorified and it goes to the Son. Because they love. Verse 13 we looked at earlier. It is God that does the work in you that motivates you to want to do the good pleasure of God. And also to do the will of God. God is love, and it is God that works in us. It is love that works in us. It's the love of Christ that constraineth us. That's that power to motivate us. So, how does God do the work in us? We saw earlier, do we just sit there and get zapped? No, it's through the working of His, God, of His Word. His Word works effectually in us. God worketh in us through His Word. 
the grace of God motivates us through that word. Look over at First uh, Thessalonians three. First Thessalonians three. Boy, I really wish I hadn't told that joke before we got started. Verse twelve. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you, to the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Grace motivates us through love, and it is the Lord Jesus Christ that makes you increase and abound in that love one toward another. Again, the issue here is God doing the work in you. The motivation as you mature, that maturing process happens through the study of God's word, rightly divided, the life of Christ being built up in you, and then you, can, you are motivated by the love of Christ. You are motivated by that ability to give, to love, to give, to esteem others better than yourselves, to come along and see an issue and figure out Maybe, you're, maybe your answer to the, you see somebody in a struggle, maybe it's not your job to go fix it. Maybe it's just your job to provide comfort. Maybe it's just your job to say, hey, I'm here if you need me. Maybe it is your job to fix it. Every situation is going to be different. Look over to Ephesians 3. That's part of that maturing process, having some wisdom to understand what each situation requires. Ephesians 3 and verse 16. That he, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Here's the Holy Spirit strengthening us with might in our inner man. So now we have God the Father working in us, right, to do his will. The Lord Jesus Christ working in us, making us to increase and abound in love. And here the Holy Spirit is working with us, strengthening our inner man. In verse, uh, verse um, 20, where he talks about according to the power that worketh in us, that's the Holy Spirit you see back up in 16. That's that power. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all working in us. And they do that through the Word of God that works effectively in us. You know, there really isn't any room left for us to try and change our inner man we just get in the way. You got God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit there. Get out of their way and let them do their job. Don't get in there and gum up the works. Study this book. Respond to the conviction. You get, get, get convicted by the Holy Spirit. And then the way it, the Holy Spirit works is through verses. You can build up a reservoir of verses and th that's how the Holy Spirit can work through you. Work through the verses. If... if the Holy Spirit can convict you of right and wrong, but if, if you don't have any point of reference of this book, the Holy Spirit has nothing to go to use to say, hey, this is what my word says. He's not going to say, hey, go read the commentary. Go put in a tape or an MP3, sorry, or whatever it would be today. You don't even know what the tape is, do you? He says, the Holy Spirit says, it's in my book. I wrote you a book. That's where you find out about the love of Christ. That's where you find out the motivation. Verse 19, I think we talked about this last hour, to know the love of Christ. Remember, it's the love of Christ that constrains us, that has that power sufficient to produce the effect. This is not, this is not having a, a knowledge of the love of Christ, but to know the love of Christ. Paul's prayer is that we would know the love of Christ with patches, with patches, past of knowledge. He's not simp simply speaking of knowing, of having a, a, a knowledge about the love of Christ. He's speaking of the love of Christ motivating you. You know, in the Bible, to use the word know, 
It often has to do with the in intimacy of a man and a wife. No more intimate relationship than that relationship between a man and his wife. And he, the word is used is know. To know the love of Christ. To have an intimate experience with the love of Christ. To, be, to have the love of Christ matter or make a difference in your life. To have the love of Christ motivate your life. Look at the, the end of the verse talks about that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. God is love that ye might be filled with all the love of God. Every attribute of God comes from his love. To be filled with the love of God is to be filled with the fullness of God. It's to have the mind of Christ. It's that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you would be rooted, be grounded in love. You think about it, you know, a, a tree is, well, in the Northwest not so much, but, you know, a tr tree gets rooted into the ground. It, you, that tree's not going anywhere. It's rooted, it is grounded, it is, it is firmly there, and those roots go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper the more mature that tree gets. I tried to dig a, a little bush up, and, and the roots were like three times underneath the ground as they were, this, this little bush I should have been able to just pull out, I spent an hour and a half digging it out. <laughs> be rooted, be grounded. So I want to show you a, couple of, a few examples of love in action, of love motivating. The first one, is the Lord Jesus Christ. And you may have seen this before, but get Malachi 3. Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. Malachi 3 and Romans 8. Malachi 3, verse 16. Prophetic scripture about the nation of Israel. Malachi 3, verse 16. Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. Come over to Romans eight thirty two. It says that the man will spare his son that served him. Did the Lord Jesus Christ serve the Father? 100%, right? Completely. All the way to the death on the cross, right? Romans 8.32. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Remember John 3, 16? For God so loved that he gave. Scripture says a man, will not, a man will spare his own son if his son serves him. Jesus Christ did serve him, and God gave him to us. That's how much he loved us. Uh, Romans 8, 33. Romans 8, verse 33. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, we cannot be separated from the love of Christ. Paul also declares here, if you're paying attention, that you can't be separated from the love of God. You see, they're both there. It starts out with the love of Christ. It gets down to the love of God. But where is the love of God to be found? In Christ. All that we have, guys, is in Christ. At every level. At every level. They're here. This also is an issue of being secure. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ or the love of God the Father. It's like that thing I said earlier. Jesus puts his arms around us and says, I got you. And then God the Father comes around and puts his arms around both of us and says, okay, I got you again. And then there's the Holy Spirit on top of all that that's got you sealed. Man, you're secure. Nothing can separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Again, that love of God is found in 
Christ. We spoke about John 3, 16, God so loved that he gave. Look over at 1 Timothy 1. First Timothy 1, verse 15. God loved and he gave. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. You look at verse 14 and look how it describes it before that happens. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. That's the love of God right there. The grace of our Lord. It wasn't just abundant. It was exceeding abundant. I love the way Paul puts the, are these adjectives or adverbs, wherever they are, together. These descriptive words together. They just get more and more. And, and yes, it's gooder. <laughs> it's better-er-er. You like that one better-er? <laughs> Some of those simple words, they just relay a thing. It is exceeding abundant. Every attribute of God comes from his love. God is love. To love is to, is get to give. You see how grace and love are connected? What motivates God is his abundant love. Look over at Luke 7. A couple more of these descriptions or these, these pictures of love in action. Luke 7 and verse 36. So he go, Jesus goes to have dinner at one of the Pharisees' house, and the Pharisee's name is Simon. We're going to see the name Simon come here. It's not Simon Peter. It's Simon the Pharisee. Luke 7, verse 36. And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharaoh's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment couple things here the woman's the woman's a prostitute obviously she shouldn't have been in a pharisee's house but she apparently would you with jesus and it was she was very comfortable going into the pharisee's house so you wonder how did that all transpire that she was comfortable going into this religious leader's house to begin with but verse 38 and stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment now when the Pharisee saw which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, he would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors, the one owed fifty hundred pence and the other fifty. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seeth thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gave me no water for my feet. But she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss. But this woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head, with oil, my head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said to her, thy sins are forgiven. And they sat at meat with him, they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he said to the woman, Thy faith hath saved thee, go in peace. The woman is a picture of love motivation. It's a picture of the nation Israel. She knew she was a sinner. She knew who the Lord Jesus Christ was, and it motivated her. Her sins, her need for forgiveness, her understanding that Christ loved her and could forgive her, motivated her to do something the religious leader should have been doing. The religious leader was too pious to approach Jesus 
with love. He mocks Jesus. He invites Jesus to his house. He even has the temerity, if you read it in verse 49, to give Jesus permission to say something. And he saith, Master, say on. If Jesus told me he wanted to say something, I'd just quietly shut up and say, okay. <laughs> and I wouldn't say, okay, you have permission. But this woman, this sinner, woman's glory is her hair. And I don't mean that in a pious way or in a prideful way, but women love their hair. This woman took her hair and washed his feet. And he didn't wear shoes and socks. He wore Birkenstocks. <laughs> his feet got dirty. She took her hair and washed his feet because she understood the issue of forgiveness and love and the motivation. Her love motivated her understanding of who she was and who the Messiah was. That's the other thing. This is a sinner that understands who the Messiah is and this religious leader that's denying who this is. Again, this Pharisee is not inviting Jesus over because he thinks Jesus is such a great guy and wants to have dinner and get to know him a little bit. He's coming over to mock him and do exactly what happened here. Look over at uh, Philemon 4. Philemon is the book you take Romans through Titus together, you wrap it all up in a neat little package, and you have the grace life on display in Philemon. And you know what? He can do it in 25 verses. Don't overcomplicate it. It's the shortest epistle he writes. He puts the grace life on display in three ways through three men in 25 simple verses. It's not complicated. Philemon 4. I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers, hearing of thy love and faith, which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in thy love, because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. Wherefore, Though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient, yet for love's sake I rather beseech thee, being such an one as Paul the aged, and now also the prisoner of Jesus Christ. We're not going to go through and reteach this book, but take the doctrine found in the books of Roman through Titus, and they there applied in the book of Philemon. And you see it three ways. Paul gives thanks to God because he has heard of Philemon's love towards others, that grace motivation. Philemon was a slave owner, and yet he was known for his love. He wasn't known as this evil taskmaster. He's known because of his love, not only toward the Lord Jesus Christ, but towards others. Paul says, Philemon, you've got rights concerning Onesimus. I, Paul, Paul the aged, the guy that got all the revelation from the Lord Jesus Christ, I can order you to receive him. But for love's sake, I beseech you. It's like he says, Phil, I'm going to esteem you better than me. And in love, I beseech you to receive Onesimus. I have the office. But I'm going to esteem you better than me. And I'm going to ask you to do, what I'm, to do this. Now, what he does, though, he asks Philemon to beseech Onesimus better than himself and to receive him because Onesimus esteems Philemon better than Onesimus because he's coming back. If Onesimus didn't esteem Philemon better than himself, he wouldn't come back, but he understands what's happened. You see in the book of Philemon the grace of God on display and being motivated by love. Paul loved Philemon and gave Onesimus back. The issue of love and giving. You can read out Philemon, and, and all you see is, is love motivating all three of these people towards one another. Come over and look at Titus 3. Titus 3, verse 3. 
For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which He shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that, being ju justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. Titus 2.11, where we started, says the grace of God appeared. You see here it talks about in a similar context the kindness and love of God appeared. When the grace of God appeared, the love of God appeared. The kindness of God appeared. And that it's God's grace that makes the change in us. Look, in the, You see that in verse 8? That they which have believed in God might be m careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto all men. They believed in God. They can be careful to maintain the good works because it's God that's doing a work in them. They're motivated by the love of Christ. The love of Christ is constraining them. The change in us becomes, comes because of God's grace, not by any works that we have done. The grace of God is intertwined with the love of God. In verse 4, God loved. In verse 7, God gave. And in verse 8, we should. God loved us. He gave his son for us. And that should motivate us to continue on in our good works. God loved, God gave, and we should. Ephesians 4, verse 22. Ephesians 4, verse 22. That ye put off concerning... The former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Just as we are saved from eternity in hell to, etern to eternal life with Lord Jesus Christ by God's grace, so also we're saved from our old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, to the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness by grace through faith. Works is excluded. We can't put, we can't go from the old man to the new man without God's grace. It's God's grace that makes that happen. The old man was crucified. We can therefore put on the new man. If, she, if God didn't love us and God hadn't sent Jesus, none of that would be possible. You see, it's God's grace that does everything. At the, at the very basic level, the, the very base building block is God's grace and God's love for his creation. It is God that worketh in us both to will and to do his good pleasure. Look at Galatians 2.20. Galatians 2.20 I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who what? Who loved me and gave himself for me. See that? Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. It just doesn't stop. You see the love of God and you see that he gave. And you see that God loved you and he gave you. Over and over, God loved me and God gave himself for me. Over and over. Therefore, it's the love of Christ that constrains us. That's the motivation. Love. Appreciation. You can live godly because the Lord Jesus Christ lives in our flesh and the life that we live is by the 
faith of the Son of God. Jesus Christ is faithful. That's how we live our life, the faithfulness of the Son of God. Look over at Philippians 1. Philippians 1 and verse 6, and we'll be done. Don't ever forget, this is a great verse to memorize. This is a great, great verse to go to bed with every night. Philippians 1, verse 6. Being confident of this very thing. What very thing, Paul? That he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. God began a good work in you, and he will perform it all the way out to the day of Jesus Christ. God is faithful. The love of Christ constraineth us. The love of Christ is the power that is sufficient to produce the effect to give us victory in life today. Everything that we do, our motivation is not to get a reward and get some grand title in heaven. The motivation is the love of Christ. Christ loved us. God loved us, gave himself for us, and we should live. What should we live? <laughs> Soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. So what's the motivation? The love of Christ constrains us is the motivation. That will take care of a lot of, a lot of problems going on around in gray circles. That'll be the answer. If you can get that straight, you'll understand what the other issue is. But forget all that. If you want victory in your life today, Understand, the motivation is not a better seat at the table because that's not even what we're talking about. The motivation is the love of Christ. God loved me. God gave himself for me, and I should. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that the power is of you, Lord. It's, it's not based on us. You are faithful. You have begun a good work in us, and you will continue it, Lord. My prayer would be that we would all rest in that. We would all, through a daily intake of your word, come to an understanding of the love of Christ that constraineth us, how your grace motivates us to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, Lord. And that when life is coming at us from all ang angles, Lord, and life is, life is hard some days, that we would rest in the love of Christ that you put your arms around us and said, I got you. And God put his arms around, the Father put his arms around that and said, I got you both. And then that we're sealed on top of all that with the Holy Spirit, that nothing can separate us from the love of God and that that is our motivation, Lord. We praise you for that. We know this is all possible because of what your son did on the cross, Lord. We praise you for that and we rest in that, Lord. In your name, amen. So next we'll look at uh, adorning the gospel the dispensation of the gospel of grace, the gospel.